Now hear this. Now hear this. So compensating for the magnetic field of an iron-hulled ship was pretty complicated. And that started to get scientists and engineers thinking about how can I create a maritime compass that doesn't require the Earth's magnetic field, that works on some other principle. And that's going to be the second half of our discussion as we talk about the development and implementation of the gyro compass. So follow me. We're going to go down one deck and we're going to go into the gyro compass room. This, by the way, is the radio room, and that's going to be the subject of another one of our videos in the future. Now, the gyro compass room has a little warning across it that authorized personnel only are allowed in here. And one of the ways to get in trouble on a ship is to be found in the gyro compass room if you don't belong there. Well, this is it. This is a gyro compass. Many of our young visitors think it's R2-D2, but it's not. Many of our older visitors think that it's a uh, Weber kettle for making barbecue uh, steaks on the ship. It's not that either. Um, it is a gyroscope inside a special mount. And everybody's familiar with gyroscopes, even if you don't think you are. If you played with a top as a kid, and you notice the top kind of resists being pushed in one way or the other, that's the same as a gyroscope. And the insides of this uh, gyro compass consist of a gyroscope, and this is a diagram. And the gyroscope is free to move in all three of its axes, and those three axes are vertical, horizontal, and the spin axis, in other words, the axis that goes through the middle of the gyroscope wheel. And we have a diagram that we'll show you to illustrate that. This animation shows a gyroscope which is depicted as the gold disc with the brown axis running through it in the middle of the picture. And this gyroscope is mounted in such a way that it's free to move in all three axes. Furthermore, the animation shows that as the vertical axis and the horizontal axis change, the orientation of the spin axis of the gyroscope does not change. So if the spin axis is oriented with the rotation of the earth, as the ship moves and as the horizontal and vertical axes move, the gyroscope remains in position, and that is the fundamental principle that allows the gyro compass to work. Now, I mentioned when we were up on the bridge that scientists and engineers in the 19th century began to think about how can we create a compass that doesn't rely on the Earth's magnetic field, but still reliably points to true north. And the first patent for such a design using a gyroscope was in 1885. That compass didn't work particularly well. The key patent for gyro compasses, gyro compasses was in 1906, and that was a German patent by an engineer named Anschutz Kempfe. And uh, after he patented that uh, compass, and it worked quite well, the entire German Imperial Navy adopted it very quickly. In 1908 in the United States, Elmer Ambrose Sperry patented a gyro compass, and this that we're looking at is a Sperry gyro compass, it was very quickly adopted by the U.S. Navy and installed on all of their warships. Now, the problem with the gyro compasses was they were expensive, 
They were complicated to manufacture and difficult to manufacture. And so they were limited to warships and high-end uh, uh, maritime transportation, such as the Queen Mary, when she was built in the 1930s, she had a gyro compass installed. By the beginning of World War II, the U.S. Navy saw that the gyro compass was going to be a significant advantage in uh, fighting a two-ocean war, or fighting any kind of ocean war for that matter. Um, and so they approached the Chrysler Corporation and they said, you guys build uh, complicated machines, you build them at a reasonable and affordable price, can you take on the job of creating a mass-produced gyro compass? And Chrysler Corporation responded, and in fact they did. And so this compass and most World War II gyro compasses that you'll see on museum ships and so on are made by the Chrysler Corporation, same people that made cars. Chrysler was so proud of that, in fact, that after the war was over, they put out this little booklet that um, it was uh, given out at all the dealerships, and it's called A War Job Thought Impossible, and it tells the story of developing the gyro compass. Quite nicely illustrated as well. So how does a gyro compass work? Well, it's pretty complicated and we don't have enough time to go into all of the individual details. But let's think about that gyroscope, which is free to move in all of its axes. That gyroscope will move in such a way that it aligns itself with the rotational axis of the Earth. And so we could put a compass rose on the spindle of that uh, gyroscope, and point the compass rose at true north, at, at the north end of the axis, if you will, and it turns out it will stay there no matter where we go around the Earth. That gyroscope will continue to find true north and the compass rose that we've attached will point to true north. Now it's a little more complicated than that. It does require weighting and dampening of the, of, of the gyroscope in order, to, um, in order to prevent it from uh, losing that uh, uh, ability to find true north and so that it stays steadily on true north as we would need for a navigational device. Uh, but that's essentially how it works. It was absolutely revolutionary because what are the advantages of a gyro compass? Well, one, it points to true north and it always points to true north. It is unaffected by the Earth's magnetic field. So that chart we saw where we sometimes are just a degree or two off of magnetic north, uh, of true north, and other times we're tens of degrees for, away from magnetic, uh, true north using a magnetic compass. That's not a problem with the gyro compass. It always points to true north. The second advantage of the gyro compass is it's unaffected by magnetic fields. So the magnetic field of this iron ship, steel ship, is not going to affect how the gyro compass performs. The disadvantage of the gyro compass, if we lose power at sea, if the gyro spins down because it is electrically driven, then we can't restart the gyro compass at sea and we have to fall back on using the magnetic compass. Now, having said that, I have a friend who is an electrician's mate, and he says that he successfully restarted a gyro compass at sea. So, sea story or reality, I don't know. But uh, that is one of the issues with, with the gyro compass. Now, you followed us as we walked down here, and we walked down uh, a ladder, and we went aft into the, uh, we're on the, port side of the deck house right now, we're quite a ways from the bridge. It would be really inconvenient if every time I wanted to know the course, I had to run down here, take the top off of the gyro compass, and look at the compass rows to see what direction we were going. Well, it turns out we don't have to do that. So we're back on the bridge, and no, the answer to the question I asked down in the gyro compass room is, we don't have to run down there and look at the gyro compass to see what direction we're going. There are a series of what are called gyro repeaters all over the ship. 
This is the primary one. This is the one that the helmsman uses to steer the ship by. And if you look closely at this one, you can see we're heading now at about 3, 4, 9 degrees, according to uh, this gyro repeater. That is, if the gyro compass were in operation. It isn't right now. But that's actually probably pretty close to, uh, that's frankly pretty close to the actual uh, heading that the ship is on. But there are other gyro repeaters that are on the ship for other purposes. There are other uh, gyro compass repeaters on the ship. We're here on the bridge now, and there are two more right close by on the bridge wings. There's another one up on the flying bridge for a helmsman who would be stationed there. There's one in the aft steering on top of the uh, on top of the, the aft deck house, and there's another one down in emergency steering down below decks. The purpose of the two on the bridge wings is not to steer the ship, but rather to take bearings. And the way we do that is to run into the chart room behind me and get this bearing circle. These are also sometimes referred to as an azimuth circle. This particular one was built in 1943, as you can see from the date. And, interesting thing about it, it was built by the Lionel Corporation. Now, if you're approximately the same age that I am, you remember Lionel trains when you were a kid. Lionel was making trains even before World War II. These are toy trains. Um, and the Navy came to them and said, hey, can you build uh, azimuth circles or bearing circles for us? A lot of corporations in World War II that had manufacturing capability were asked to produce war materiel uh, during the war, and then they went back to their normal production after the war. Lionel was just one of many corporations that did that. Now, the way the bearing circle works is it's kind of like a gun sight. We have the rear sight here, and the front sight is here. In fact, you can even see there's a little notch on the rear sight, and there's what looks like a sight post on the front sight. That's one of the ways that we can we can sight. The other way is through the slot on the rear sight and the vertical wire on the front sight. The whole point of using the bearing circle is to be able to take a bearing from the ship to a landmark. It might be a mountain, it might be a lighthouse, and it's a way of plotting your exact position when you're close to land. And I'll show you a chart in a few minutes that uh, is an example of, of that type of um, uh, determination of your position. It's called taking a, a fix. And so let's take this out to the bridge wing and show you how it works. Now a lot of you probably think California is all sunshine and Baywatch lifeguards and all that. It's not. This is a typical winter day here in California. It's cold, wet, miserable, it's humid. We don't get snow to any great extent, but, you know, we've got all the other fun things about winter. So, just so you know, if you ever come to visit us in the wintertime. All right, here on the bridge wing, or on the starboard wing, is another compass repeater, a gyro compass repeater. And this one is on gimbals. As you can see, it can move freely in its two axes. And the purpose of this is to be able to take bearings so that we can plot a fixed location on a chart. And of course, this only works when we're close to land. We take the bearing ring, place it over the gyro compass repeater, and then using this as the rear sight and this as the front sight, we select a position to, uh, or a, a landmark rather, to take a bearing on. It might be a lighthouse or a mountaintop or something along those signs and we can sight through the slot on the rear sight and the wire on the front sight so we get a very precise positioning. Then I can look through the small hole at the bottom and I can read the bearing on the compass repeater. 
we take a couple of different bearings on two different landmarks, hopefully somewhat distant, and we can go back into the chart room. We draw the lines of those, those bearings, and where they intersect is where we're located. We've moved from the bridge into the chart room of the Red Oak Victory for just a few minutes to point out a couple features of nautical charts. This is a historic World War II chart of Rendova Island and its harbor, and this was an island in the Solomon Islands group, famous, of course, during World War II. All nautical charts are drawn with true north being the top of the chart. So any vertical line drawn through the uh, center of the chart will point towards true north. In order for the mariner, however, to be able to use a magnetic compass, every chart has at least one, if not multiple, compass roses of this type. And a couple of things to point out on this compass rose. One is it shows us true north, where the star is. The star, of course, represents the north star. And it shows us the magnetic variation. So a magnetic compass at this location on Earth will point 7 degrees 55 minutes east of true north and that was measured in 1940. It also tells us at the bottom here that we should increase that variation by three minutes annually. So if this chart was drawn in 1944 that would be a 12 minute increase and that would make this chart um, 8 degrees and 7 minutes to the east. Well, we're back in the warmth of the chart house, and we're looking again at our World War II chart of Rendova Harbor. And we can see here several fixed positions that were taken by a ship entering the harbor. And using the same strategy that we just talked about out on the bridge wing. So here, for example, at 0314, 314 in the morning, a fixed position was taken by sighting this white beacon on one side of the harbor and this beacon on the other side of the harbor. And the uh, bridge wing uh, compass repeater would have been used to determine those two bearings. And we come back into the chart house, draw the two lines, uh, and get a fixed position. I hope you enjoyed our video on compasses and how they were used to guide ships like the Red Oak Victory. We're going to be doing more videos in the future about navigational instruments and one of those that we'll talk about, of course, is the sextant and how the sextant was used during World War II and really right up until the 1990s to determine the latitude of a ship at sea. If you enjoyed our video, Give us a thumbs up in the uh, comment section below. If you have questions, please write them in the comment section. And please subscribe to the Red Oak Victory YouTube channel so that you'll get to see more of these videos in the future.